lady ran into the bedroom to find her husband sound asleep. The wife said, wake up, honey. You need to get up and out of that bed and get with it. And the husband had his face buried in a pillow and he responded with a muffled voice, give me three good reasons why I should get out of bed. And he pulled his covers and she, and she then ripped his covers and sheets off of him and said to him, one, because it's Sunday and as Christians we always go to church on Sundays. Two, because we only have 40 minutes until church starts and you haven't even showered. Three, because you're the pastor and you need to be there. Well, just like this wife to her husband, the pastor, Peter, many centuries ago, gave a word like this to those who were leading the flock of God, a word of encouragement, a word of challenge, a word of motivation. And I invite you this morning to turn with me there to 1 Peter chapter 5, and we want to begin reading with verse number 1. I want to bring you a message titled this morning, Taking Up Your Duty in the Flock of God. Taking up your duty in the flock of God. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 1. We've been expounding through the book of 1 Peter verse by verse, and this is where we are today. Peter writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Peter here specifically mentions, addresses, and charges the elders. But this passage, I believe, also is an exhortation and a call to every person in the flock of God to take up their God-given duties and to fulfill them in the right way and for the right reasons. In this message, I want to explain to you what Peter says to these elders and then I want to draw out for you from this passage some suggestions for us all and I believe these suggestions will help us all take up our God-given duty and fulfill it. Consider verse number one here in our text. Here Peter begins by addressing the elders among you. The word elder here in our text is one of three words that's used in the New Testament and it's used inter these words are used interchangeably to refer to the office of the pastor. You'll find in the New Testament the word elder used. You'll find in the New Testament the word bishop or overseer used. And then you'll find the term pastor used as well, or shepherd. And we know that this role of an elder was adopted by the church of Jerusalem in Acts 11 and 30. And Paul and Barnabas, they applied this role to the local church, uh, each one they founded. And the term elder was used in biblical times in secular Greek to refer to someone who is mature, someone who is older, someone who is seasoned and experienced, someone who has been around. In church life, 
uh, the term elder was used to refer to a man who was spiritually mature in the faith. In 1 Timothy 3, verse number 6, even Paul spoke of this concept of a bishop, an elder, a pastor, being someone who serves the church and a person who is appointed to this God-given role should not be a novice. And so if a pastor is to lead others to become spiritually mature, and certainly that is one of the chief roles of a pastor, then he himself must be spiritually mature and also continuing to strive to become more mature in the faith. Now Peter gives a threefold basis for this exhortation. If you look in verse number 1, Peter refers to himself as a fellow elder. Notice he's not elevating himself as a pope or someone who is the head of all the elders. Uh, here he is a humble man. And here he speaks as a fellow laborer in the Lord's work with these other elders. Also here in verse number 1, if you notice, Peter refers to himself as a witness of the sufferings of Christ. The word witness here in our text speaks of someone giving a testimony. Someone being an eyewitness and then speaking forth what they have seen and experienced. Well, Peter was an eyewitness of all that Jesus went through. He was an eyewitness being one of the twelve disciples. He was an eyewitness there in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was betrayed by one of them, one of the disciples, Judas, and then arrested. Peter was there when Jesus was led and tried and condemned. Peter was around during all of this. He saw the sufferings of Christ and all that Jesus accomplished. And now he speaks as a witness. He gives a testimony. And then Peter in this verse refers to himself as a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. The word partaker in verse number 1 literally means a partner. In other words, Peter is letting these elders know that he will as well, since he is a fellow laborer, he one day will share with them in their future destiny when they are ushered into the glorious kingdom of our God. Now notice verse number 2. Peter then gives a command to these elders. Look at what he says. He says, shepherd the flock of God which is among you. Now, you know throughout the Bible, God's people are referred to sheep and the Lord is referred to as our shepherd. In Genesis 48 verse 15, Jacob, the patriarch, the grandson of Abraham referred to God as the shepherd who led him and fed him throughout his life. In Psalm 23, my favorite Old Testament passage, David so beautifully referred to the Lord as my shepherd. In Psalm 100 verse 3, the scriptures declare we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. In Isaiah 53 verse 6, the prophet referred to us as sheep going astray. And then in John chapter 10 verse number 10, the Lord Jesus declared that he is the good shepherd and he is the one who gives his life for his sheep. Well, the Apostle Peter continues that imagery by describing God's people, the flock, the church, you and I, as sheep. And he tells those who are within that flock 
those within that flock who are spiritually mature that God has delegated to them the responsibility of shepherding the flock of God. This word shepherd literally is a command. It's a command from which we gather the word pastor. You know that a shepherd, he tends to sheep. A shepherd feeds sheep. A shepherd guides sheep. A shepherd protects and guards the sheep. A shepherd looks after the sheep that he has in his care. Sheep need someone to defend them. Sheep need somebody to guide them. Sheep need someone to take care of their needs. So that's why the Lord has appointed to those who are spiritually mature the work of shepherding. Hear this call to shepherd the flock. It's a spiritual work. Spiritually looking after the well-being of the flock. Spiritually providing food from the Word of God to nourish and to sustain the flock. Spiritually directing and leading them to where God would have them to be in the future. Spiritually caring for each member and their needs. Spiritually protecting the flock from spiritual danger. Notice here the elders, the shepherd that's been commanded to shepherd the flock. Notice here they're to shepherd the flock of God. Do you see that? Of God. In other words, the leaders, the elders in a position of leadership, they're not the owners of the flock. The flock belongs to God. Paul tells us in the book of Acts that the flock of God, he purchased his flock with the blood of his own son. The elder is an under-shepherd who has been entrusted with the role of tending to the people of God under the direction of the chief shepherd, Jesus. And then notice it's the flock of God among you. Now, if an elder is to shepherd the people of God, then he must be among them. And I'll say this, a pastor will only know God's people and how to help them by spending time with them and walking with them through the times of rejoicing in life and also through the times of sorrow and the times of grieving and the times of testing. Now this work of shepherding the flock, Peter says, it entails serving as an overseer. Do you see that in verse number 2? The term overseer there literally means to scope over, to look upon, to inspect, to care for, to look after. Spiritually, shepherds must watch over the sheep so that he can assess their spiritual conditions and know how to lead and guard and feed them properly. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, Paul told the elders at Ephesus, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. And then Peter takes this idea of shepherding the flock and serving as an overseer and he breaks it down with three more commands on how to do this. He gives a negative side and then he gives a positive side. Here he says in verse number 2 that an elder should shepherd the flock of God not by compulsion, but willingly. In other words, a shepherd should tend to the flock of God not because he has to, but because he wants to. You know, when talking to someone about the call to ministry, I believe one of the clearest Ways that a young man can know that he's been called to be a pastor is that God will place within his heart a deep and intense abiding desire 
that causes him to want to be a shepherd in serving and leading and feeding and looking after the people of God. Paul spoke of this in 1 Timothy 3 verse 1. He said, if anyone desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. Notice there, the God-given desire. And then Peter says, an elder should shepherd the flock of God not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. And the word eagerly there speaks, continuing that idea of an intense desire to do something. In other words, a shepherd should not tend to, flock, tend to the flock of God with the motive of getting rich or what he can gain from them financially and materially. But he should shepherd the flock of God because he has an intense God-given desire to look after God's people. A shepherd called and sent by God He'll have an enthusiastic, excited desire within to tend to the spiritual needs of God's people. And then I notice something else in verse number 3. Peter says that an elder should shepherd and oversee the flock of God not by being a lord over the flock, but by being an example Notice here, the shepherd, he is a leader, but not the Lord. The idea of lording over the flock implies a shepherd domineering over the people, always having to have his way, doing what he wants for the flock instead of what Jesus wants and what the flock needs in their heart. But instead, a shepherd should lead and tend to the flock of God gently and patiently by being an example before them. The word example there in verse number 3 uh, comes from a Greek term that has the idea of leaving a print, an impression, striking a blow on something, applying force and Pressure, thus making a mark, a pattern, a model to follow after. Peter has already told us in chapter 2, verse number 21, that Jesus Christ, when he came into this world, he left for us an example that we should follow in his steps. In other words, Jesus Christ entered into this world... And by his sinless life, by his servant leadership, by his humble attitude, by his submissive spirit, by his sacrificial death, by his victorious resurrection, he made such a blow on the course of humanity, a print, an impression for us to look to as a pattern. In the same way, Christ set an example for us, his disciples. Peter is saying, elders, this is how you should lead. You should make such a mark upon the minds and the hearts of the people that's there, moving upon their heart, meeting their spiritual needs, sharing the word with them, and by setting an example for the flock of God to follow. In other words, if a pastor believes his people should study the Word a certain way, then he should first model it. If a pastor believes his people should act in a certain way, then he should first model it. If a pastor believes his people should be doing some particular aspect of ministry in the service of the Lord, then he himself first must model it. When thinking of leadership in this way, it's been said that General Dwight Eisenhower used to demonstrate to people the art of leadership. And he would take a piece of string and he would set that string on a table and he would say to those listening to him, pull this string. 
And as you pull the string, it will follow wherever you wish. Push the string and it will go nowhere but bunch up into a disorganized clump. Then look at verse number 4. Peter then calls these elders to look to the future return and reward of Christ at the end. He reminds them that one day the chief shepherd will return and when he does he will appear before all in power and great glory. One reference defines this title chief Shepherd as a shepherd who is preeminent in authority and skill over all the other shepherds. Certainly this is Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 25, Jesus is described as the shepherd and bishop of our souls. In John 10, 11, Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. In Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21, Christ is called the great shepherd. And so never forget, as your pastor, I may be referred to biblically as a shepherd, but I'm always the under-shepherd. A shepherd under the great and chief shepherd Jesus. And Peter says one day, the chief shepherd, Shepherd, at the end of time, will return to earth. He'll raise the dead. He'll bring fiery judgment upon those who reject Him. He'll sit in judgment upon us all. He'll separate the sheep from the goats. And then He'll give out a reward. Notice here Peter says to these elders who have been faithful in shepherding the flock of God that they will receive a crown of glory that does not fade away. I think about how Jesus Christ, when He was in this world, He received a crown, but not a crown of glory and not a crown of gold, but He received a crown of thorns for you and me. But He invites us and calls us to serve Him, and when He returns the second time, He's not going to give to us a crown of thorns, but the crown of glory. In Peter's day, crowns were a sign of victory. They were given to those who were either athletic victors or military victors. Crowns in Peter's day were usually made of greenery. And in time, these crowns would dry out and crumble and fade away. Peter says Christ is bringing with him the eternal crown of glory that will never decay and crumble and fade away. Well, that's the duty the elders should take up in God's flock. But what about everyone else? What about each one of you? You say, I want to take up my duty for the Lord. What should I do? I've not been called to be an elder, a pastor, but I'm a Christian and I'm a member of this church and I want to take up my duty in the flock of God. Well, jot down these suggestions. Number one, don't neglect the role in this flock that God has placed in your heart. What has God placed in your heart to do for Him? What? area has he gifted you in what skills has he given to you what has he put in your heart that you have a desire to do whatever God has placed upon your heart do it get at it King Hezekiah exhorted the Levites in his day in 2 Chronicles 29 11 my sons do not neglect now for the Lord has chosen you to stand before Him, to serve Him, and to be His ministers. Don't neglect the role in this flock that God has placed on your heart. And then number two, serve in that role according to God's rules. Just as He has given rules, guidelines, boundaries, 
for the elder to serve within throughout the scriptures you can find rules and guidelines and boundaries that he wants all of his believers to serve within for him look to his word for guidance don't go rogue serve him with all your heart serve him with humility serve him with gladness serve him with joy serve him with adoration and thanksgiving and sincerity and with his will on your mind serve with the truth of of his word being your guiding rod and then number three work for him not because you have to but because he wants you to notice here the shepherd is not to fulfill this duty and take up this duty because he feels like he has to or he's under pressure or from even dishonest gain but he's to serve the Lord willingly and eagerly with that intense desire Let me say this morning, if you're serving the Lord and His people and it is a burden, it is very possible that He has a different role and a place for you to plug in than where you're serving right now. You will know that you're doing what God wants you to do. Catch this when there is an inner desire an inner sense that I can do this for him and a present need. Now, did you catch that? You'll know that you're doing what God wants you to do when there is a God-given desire, when there's a God-given inner sense that you can do this for him and when there's a present need before you to step up to. When your desire, the inner sense of a God-given ability and the need, when they line up together, you'll find that working for Him is not a drudgery, but a delight. Number four, set an example for others to follow. The shepherd here, he is to be an example And I believe each one of us as believers, we are to be a model servant to the Lord and a model servant before the Lord's people, setting an example that others will want to follow and can follow. Be an example. Then number five, know that one day He will reward those who have fulfilled their duty to His flock. Yes, the chief shepherd one day will return. And the book of Revelation chapter 22 verse 12 says, Behold, I come quickly, and when I return, I will bring my reward for you with me. You see, folks, Friday is not always payday in God's economy. Thursday is not always payday payday in God's economy. The first of the month is not always God's payday in His economy, but payday is coming for those who serve Him. The cost may be great in serving Him. It may take your energy. It may take you sacrificing. It may take you giving up some things. It may take you putting forth more effort than you would like to do according to your own flesh. But let me tell you, it will be worth it one day and a payday is coming for those who faithfully serve Him. Know that one day He will reward those who have fulfilled their duty. Well, I exhort you today, just like Peter did these elders, to take up the duty that God has for each and every single one of you in this flock. Let's stand to our feet. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you need to be saved, I invite you to come forward. I invite you to look to Jesus. I invite you to trust Him as your Lord 
you need to rededicate your life, I invite you to do that. If you need Him to show you where He wants you to plug in and step up and take up your duty in the flock, maybe right there where you are in your seat, why don't you do business with the Lord? Just praying in your heart to Him and say, Lord, make it clear to me what you've placed in my heart. Make it clear to me what you've given me a talent, a gift, an ability to do. No matter how simple or complex it may be, show me, Lord. And then, God, give me an awareness of the need and open places where I can plug in. God, help my motives to be right. God, help me to focus on the future return of your son and the reward one day. Right there, you do business with God. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for the challenge. I pray right now that you'd be speaking to hearts. And I pray that your people in their hearts would be making commitments to you. I pray that they would be open to hearing from you. God, help us to step up and fulfill our duty in your flock. In Jesus' name, amen.